As a business-to-business marketer, your needs are unique. B2B buying cycles are long, and your customers face incredibly complex decisions. Isn't it time you had a marketing platform built specifically for you? LinkedIn ads empower marketers with solutions for you and your customers. LinkedIn ads allow you to build the right relationships, drive results, and reach your customers in a respectful environment. On LinkedIn, you'll have direct access to and build relationships with decision makers. Of the 875 million users on the network, 180 million are senior level executives, 10 million are C-level executives. You will also be able to drive results with targeting and measurement tools built specifically for B2B. And they work. Audiences exposed to brand messages on LinkedIn are six times more likely to convert. LinkedIn ads also ranked number one for security, community, and ad experience as part of Business Insider's Digital Trust Study. Here at Sway Group, LinkedIn is a pivotal part of our day-to-day and is just absolutely vital for building relationships with clients and with our employees. Make B2B marketing everything it can be and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash mpn to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash MPN. Terms and conditions apply. Hey, it's Jason Falls of the Marketing Podcast Network. You know we're trying to bring you the greatest education opportunities out there. We've got another one for you, folks. The Creator Economy Expo, CEX 2023, is for content creators and entrepreneurs interested in building and growing their content-first businesses without relying on social platforms. This year's Creator Economy Expo features 10 amazing keynote speakers and over 30 in-depth breakout sessions. Join 500-plus bloggers, podcasters, authors, newsletter writers, speakers, coaches, and consultants, and freelancers at the learning and networking event for content creators. Don't be left out. Plan to attend this year, May 1st through the 3rd, 2023 in Cleveland, Ohio. Register now and get early bird pricing and the Marketing Podcast Network has a special offer for you. You can get $100 off using the coupon code MPN100. That's MPN100. Head over to CEX.events to register. CEX.events, code MPN100. Welcome to The Art of Sway. This is a podcast that brings you inside the world of marketing through the lens of influence. I'm your host, Danielle Wiley. Each week, through candid conversations with industry insiders, we will uncover how influencer marketing is making an impact across all consumer buying habits and is changing the way we talk to each other. Let's dive in. It was really great to catch up with Caleb. We worked together back at Edelman, so always good to see an old friend and colleague. But I love talking to him just about how all companies these days need to be prepared to pivot all the time, be prepared to speak up about the issues of the day and how this is kind of difficult for a lot of traditional companies and just very enlightening to hear Caleb's thoughts on how to bring some of these more traditional companies into the future so that they can best optimize everything that they're doing and succeed in today's hyper-connected world. I hope you enjoy. Caleb Gardner's career has been driven by curiosity and focused on change. For more than three years, he was the lead digital strategist for OFA, Barack Obama's political advocacy group. Caleb led one of the largest digital programs in existence, including the most followed Twitter account in the world, at Barack Obama. He's also built operational frameworks for a variety of organizations in the public and private sectors, including at prestigious professional service firms like Bain & Company and Edelman. Now, as the co-founder and managing partner of 18 Coffees, an innovation consulting firm, Caleb helps businesses like United Way Worldwide and Bose Corporation get a foothold in the future. His new book just came out. It's called No Point B, Rules for Leading Change in the New Hyperconnected, Radically Conscious Economy. Okay. Hi, Caleb. Hello. Welcome. It's so good to see you. I think I saw you pre-COVID at a conference. We like passing ships in the night. But other than that, even before that, it had been a long time. That's right. Yeah, it had. I, what conference was it? It was somewhere in New York, right? Yes, it was in New York. Half U- the conferences And are. actually, I was just talking to the organizer. I was emailing with her this morning. What is it? The um, Oh, Social Media Strategy Summit, maybe? Strategy Summit. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that had to have been three or four years ago because it was in person pre-COVID. So yeah, it's been a little bit. Yeah, and we were with a client who we no longer work with and is long gone from the brand she was at. So for <sighs> sure, a long time ago. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I mean, uh, I remember, I still remember interviewing you. I think I interviewed yes. you at Starbucks, like at the Starbucks for whatever reason. You didn't even come into the. Yeah, I remember you interviewing me. I probably wanted to get some fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very surreal. Yeah, I, re- I remember that very, very vividly because I was terrified, obviously. I'm very scary. I'm. <laughs> you should have been. <laughs> it was very fun in your book reading just all of the old Edelman stories, like going on pitches and some of the crazy client conversations we had yeah. to have. It was definitely a moment in time. Yeah, it was a weird, like transitional moment. When we were trying to convince like Fortune 100 companies to open Facebook pages, which is crazy. Now I'd probably try to convince them not to. (laughs) Yeah. I remember it was funny reading that story. You were at a pitch and trying to talk them into doing something. And, you know, the client eventually was like, I hear you and you seem really smart, but this is not going to like we're too old fashioned. And I had an almost identical experience. The beef client came in and met with us like that beef association yeah. and it was super early days and I was like have you ever heard of pioneer woman she's like this woman and she has a food blog and it seems really popular and like she lives on a farm like beef is a natural choice and they thought I was crazy like the yeah. looks I got from them it was like the craziest thing that had ever come out of my mouth was this like right before pioneer woman really blew of up of course yeah 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 that's and fun. they they did end up working with her like later of on course. Like, God, I told you so <laughs> Of course, just like the brand that I mentioned in the book eventually ended up making huge investments in social. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they all, everyone has had to, right? Yep. That was, I think I love that aspect of your book. Just this, I mean, we, I'm looking at, I have our company values up on my wall and the first one is being agile, which I think, I mean, that's a key point yep. in your book. Yeah, it might be the key point. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, and for us it's just been a matter of survival. I mean, we, you know, started as an agency with just bloggers. Had we insisted on sticking with that, that would have been disastrous. I mean, on and on and on I can list all the things. Yeah. I think for us it's obvious because we're a social media agency. Obviously we're having to pivot and change and be agile. But what about companies that are more traditional, like a CPG company or just a company that's not, hasn't kind of grown up in that space where agility is life. Yeah, it is fun to think about like what the, even the changing definition of what an influencer has meant the last 10 years and how you've, how you've had to ride that wave. I bet that's been really fun for you. I mean, I think what, what we can agree on is that the disruptive influence of technology, even if you're in a company that it hasn't disrupted yet, it's coming. And you've probably seen it coming for years. And I mean, I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, I was working at a B2B wholesaler client when I was at Bain and Company who had, you know, these old school kind of wholesale contracts that they had depended on for years and years and years. And they were just now thinking about the effects of digital on their supply chain and what they could gather from data analytics in terms of making their profitability and efficiency shoot up. They were starting to think about the effects of new consumer strategies when what we had seen in the consumer market was starting to play out in the B2B space in terms of how you manage the engagement, where you get insights from, even the like customer service, like the effects of how we thought started to think about customer service on Twitter or on social were starting to bleed into the B2B world in terms of how people wanted to be able to manage their interactions in a really fast, engaging, real-time way versus kind of an old school go to dinner with a sales rep way, right? And so, you know, I think B2B is a really interesting case study for where they kind of were able to rest on the laurels longer, but it's still coming and it's still starting to really, really change how they're doing business. And I think, I mean, I, I'm in this group called Vistage, which is like a CEO advisory. It is the yeah. CEO advisory group. And one of the things about Vistage is you're not in the group with anyone who's in the same industry as you. So I've been with, you know, someone who owns a construction company, someone who sells school uniforms, someone who makes cookies, like you see all the different industries and it through COVID, it was so interesting to see like just this instant need to have to like, oh my gosh, we have to do everything on Zoom and I need to do Slack and I need to, yeah. like it just kind of propelled everyone into, yeah. the, I mean, the computer age sounds like. What a great real world case study of immediate need for agility. Great or terrible. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both. Por que non los dos. Yeah. But I mean, we used to kind of hide the fact that we were all working from home because we felt like it made us look small and clients didn't want someone who was in a home office. They wanted someone with a fancy high rise and a receptionist and right, which is crazy because all the overhead that comes with that. But yeah, it was I know. everything really flipped very quickly. <laughs> Same. I mean, we've been around, I think, you know, only about the last five years. In the first few years, it was definitely like, you know, you figure out ways to punch above your weight and look larger than you are, right? Yeah. But, you know, COVID hits and all of a sudden we have our clients going, how do you do this remote work thing? It's It was fascinating. Yeah. Like now it's an asset. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I could probably go out there and give speeches on how to optimize for remote work. And- yeah. We just found ourselves doing training about like, how do you communicate in a remote environment? Oh, that's awesome. Culture, so you actually have. I've done that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I mean, just ba- based on our experience. That's great. It was, it was great. So speaking of experience, I wanted to talk. So you were at Edelman and then Bain, and then you went to go work for Obama for America. Yeah, close to that order. It was uh, Edelman, Obama, and then Bain. Okay. So I wanted to talk about the political piece because obviously I know you, and then we have a mutual friend, Jesse, who also did some mm-hmm. work for Obama and Michael Slaby. Like we've kind of interacted in spheres with folks who have been like agency side and then gone into the political space and then and kind of use that to propel themselves forward. I mean, it's similar to what COVID did for everyone in terms of how they work. I feel like working in that political space is like you almost get 15 years of experience in the course of a year because it's so intense. 100%. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, actually, I credit a lot of the our colleagues at Edelman for even helping me get that job. I mean, it was just serendipitous how many people from – Obama 2008, Obama 2012 that we ended up working with. Jesse, you know, and Michael and all the people that you you mentioned definitely helped both guide me and refer me to to that job. Yeah, I think what's unique about the political world, I heard it described as like one of the fastest moving, highest risk startups you could ever be a part of because you're basically spending all your time building infrastructure for this one goal and then tearing it all down. It's wild. And I think... Because I worked in it for four years, we kind of did that for every political cycle. So like the midterms and then the 2020 campaign. And we were much more engaged in the like political advocacy of policy making and decision making. And so there was also like campaign by campaign staffing up and executing and tearing down. So it was it was wild. I mean, we had the government shut down and we had a rollout of the ACA marketplaces and the rollout of the Paris Climate Accords and we were like attacked by hacker group and it was just wild. This all feels like 20 years ago. It did, right? It does. <laughs> I feel like I've lived like 86 lifetimes since the rollout of the ACA. You and me like- both. Like it's crazy. But it wasn't it wasn't like guaranteed to be a thing. Like we were, no, we were yeah. like, if this fails, like it's going to be terrible. Like it was it was so stressful. I was not as gray. You know me back then. I was not as gray as I am same, now same. after that experience. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it's it's it, like a world changing experience. I mean, I I definitely recommend anyone to like spend just a little bit of time in it um and you'll you'll never regret it. So you did that and then you went to Bain and then you started your own. So talk a little bit about 18 coffees like yeah. let's pimp this out. I I mean, I love everyone who works for you. So <laughs> I, I mean, I, what I was always interested in when we were doing work at Edelman was like the the stuff where we got to go beyond just like a good marketing campaign. I mean, we got to do some fun, creative work. But the things that I was always most interested in is like, how is this changing business going forward? You know, like we're, we're not just adding a YouTube video onto a Facebook page to support an ad campaign, but we're actually like restructuring how you are going to market and what your value prop is with clients, with customers. We're learning interesting things from the market and pivoting our products accordingly. We're, we're getting people in the organization to not work in silos anymore. We're getting them to work together, to go to market together. And so some of that more infrastructure type building around digital capacity was some of the work that I was always most interested in. So coming out of Obama world, when there's no natural, what do you do now? You know, when I was just like having coffee with people and being like, well, I don't know what I'm going to go do next. Like, this is kind of the work I'm interested in. So one of the reasons why I went to Bain and went to a consulting firm, because I was like, oh, these are the people who are really reorging and, and, and building business for the next generation. And that turned out to be, to be fair to Bain, half true, maybe like they're super smart, Loved my experience there, 
But one, you know, we were entering the Trump era around then, and I was definitely like having an existential crisis about leaving politics and not doing, you know, work that Mm -hmm. really mattered to make the world better anymore. But also, I think the ways that that a lot of the big consulting firms think about strategy and transformation, you know, are using toolkits that are 30, 40 years old. And I was like, no, we need to be leaning into what's possible now in a digital world. And so we we started building something that I think is really needed, which was how do we take the effects of digital disruption and the effects of social disruption, think about those together in terms of what that means for business going forward. And so all of our clients tend to be in a transition based on the effects of those things. And that's kind of why we started focusing on building capability around change management, because we could be the best strategists in the world, we could be the best subject matter experts in the world. And if our clients' organizations, you know, we're constantly running into cultural problems, we're constantly running into power dynamics, we're constantly running into like, oh, that would never work here. Oh, never, we could never get the budget approved for mm-hmm. that. Or, you know, all the things that you and I ran into to when we would talk to clients at Edelman. It was like it had nothing to do with whether or not the idea was good or the strategy was right. right. It was all cultural, bureaucratic things that would kill it. And so we were like, we need to have capability not just in being good strategists but in how we actually make change within organizations so that they are able to execute on that strategy. And so that's been the most fun work we've done in the last few, five years. It's not only like being able to think big picture, being able to really innovate with clients, but bringing everyone along. Like here's how the, the organization needs to change accordingly to be able to do that kind of work. And then, I mean, I feel like there's a real social good element too that runs through everything That's right. that you do. Is that just the price of doing business? these days, which I also want to talk to you about? Or is that like, okay, we're, we're advising these companies. And so is it just good business advice? Or is it the way you have to be now? Or is that purposeful, because you want to be doing good in the world. And so by helping companies kind of incorporate that, not that it's self serving, but it's helping everyone. And it's kind of making a bigger impact. The correct answer is D all of yeah. the above. <laughs> <laughs> both we saw market opportunity for it like we didn't think there were enough people talking about you know the fact that we as consumers are now carrying around the most powerful communication devices in our pockets and now have access to be able to tell companies hey you're not living the values that you're saying that you're living like we thought that those things were going to intersect in a really powerful way we came from i mean i came from a political background you know like we we felt like we had a point of view on that and we had expertise and network connections in the what I'll broadly define as kind of the social impact space. And, you know, we really wanted to do that work. We thought it was important and we wanted to be able to come to work every day feeling like we were doing important world-changing work. Same. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, who doesn't want that, Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, I actually wrote down this quote from your book, like from towards the beginning about this, the need to morally perform in the global social media theater and how Mm -hmm. this like not communicating might as well mean not existing. And this has come up for me personally a lot this year. I think there was this period of time in the spring where it was just like Mm -hmm. one awful thing after another that were really hitting the people who work for us. So, you know, the leak of Roe v. Wade and then the Buffalo shooting and then the Uvalde shooting and then the actual overturning of Roe v. Wade and inflation and just everything is so heavy right now. And I think even back when we, you know, first started the company, you might talk to people one-on-one about it, but it wasn't typical to be sending out a message to the company. And I found myself having a send out messages over and over again and explain that we were here and that we were holding space for people and we get if you can't work today. And I think the brands that we work with as well have been kind of faced with you can't stay silent anymore, which is the total opposite of how things were maybe 10, 15 years ago, where they would never work with an influencer who did have strong political feelings. And now we have brands who won't work with influencers who don't have (laughs) strong political feelings (laughs) that align. That's crazy. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I mean, obviously, again, this is a key point in your book, but just the fact that you can't stay silent anymore, that that's just no longer an option. And and I'd love to hear just your thoughts on that in general and also like how you help get people over that hump, because I think 
that's a hard leap to make if you've been in the business world for a long time. It is. It, this is a really tough subject matter. It's one of the reasons why I felt like I needed to write about it because I don't think there are easy answers to this question. Some of it is a judgment call, but I do think that we have to recognize the moral responsibility we have to use what are the most powerful communication devices we've ever had before to good ends. And that there is some ethical trade-off every time we decide not to do that, or we decide to take a digital detox, or we decide to delete our accounts. I'm not saying that that's not the right answer, but I do think we should have some consternation about like, am I giving up my power to do good right now? I'm definitely a supporter of digital detoxes. I think we have to treat this doing good as a marathon over the long run. And so I do think people need to take care of themselves and figure out the context for themselves in where they're going to engage so that they don't feel like they have to be engaged in every single issue or responding to every single thing. But ultimately, we have to find that context for ourselves and make those decisions for ourselves about where we are are going to use our voice and we're always going to lean in. So that that's one thing um, from a personal, you know, responsibility standpoint. But I do think that it's hard. And I tell stories in the book about it. It's hard for us to make judgments about other people's choices about that. Because I yeah. don't think we have all the context for why someone chooses to lean into an issue and not lean into another issue. We don't know anything about what's happening in their personal lives. We don't know anything that's happening behind the scenes about their ability to even lean in. So we have to make those moral choices for ourselves and then actually do our best to not make judgments about other people and how they make those moral choices because we just don't have yeah, the full context. I mean, giving people the, the grace to at least opening up the dialogue about it. I like that story you told about your friend who decided to, instead of just posting about stuff, that he was actually going to go out there and volunteer and make change. And then he had a friend who was like, I'm so angry at you for not posting about all of these issues going on yeah. in the world right now and it was it was a total misunderstanding but I think it's indicative of a lot of the judgment that goes on these days exactly online. and this, that's a true story I mean and I've heard of other people who've had very similar experiences I think the calling out people for not calling out other people has become like a common practice when we're all trying to like lean into things like online activism but to me, there's just it becomes really problematic because we just don't have all the information. And I think it's really hard as a leader too. like going back to this spring where it was just one hit after another. I mean, not to be like a sob story, but leaders are people too. And when you yourself are hurting about everything going on, it can be difficult sometimes to step back yeah. and put those feelings into words and let people know that you're there and have the exact right thing to say and That's to right. know that people need to hear something, but you're struggling to even know what's the right thing to put out there. I mean, I think it's a difficult space. I've heard a lot of leaders talk about how hard that is. Yeah, it's especially hard when you have any sort of platform, any sort of leadership responsibility, because then not using that platform at key moments is even more ethically dubious, right? Yeah. And it's at what point when there's so much going on that's terrible, like what's the threshold? Like how many people have mm -hmm. to be shot? How many people have to be impacted? Right. It can be very hard to figure out how to not go through every single day being like, okay, here's a list of terrible things that happened today. I'm holding space for you. And then Tuesday, here's everything else that <laughs> happened. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, what, where do you draw the line? Yeah. It's a very terrible decision to have to make. And what I usually say is the best thing to do is try to think through that before those issues start to hit the news cycle, before they come up. Like, what do we care about? What is directly involved in the way that we do business? Like, are there things that are part of our supply chain or that are directly affect our employees, for example, like some pre-planning really saves a lot of heartache in the moment for having to make terrible decisions, like you said, about is this a big enough threshold for us to weigh in? So I know that you did social media management for Barack Obama and... I love that quote you had that he said, you're a better Barack Obama than he is. <laughs> <laughs> but I think being a social media manager is one of the hardest jobs there is these days and certainly doing it for such a high profile person all mm -hmm. the more so like that has to teach you a lot about how to do that pre-planning and how to react when there's stuff to react like the kind of the mix of reactive and proactive. I would imagine that that experience has 
or that experience taught you a lot that you can now bring into your consulting with companies in terms of how they can kind of navigate these issues? Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, I think we benefited from the fact that when you are a politician of any any sort, but especially the highest profile ones, the bell curve kind of flips on its head of what normal community engagement looks like. So, you know, if you're you or I were running like a brand account, you would have like people who really love the brand, people who really hate the brand. And then most people are like right there in the middle. Like you've just got people who like couldn't really care less, to be honest. Like they're just kind of engaged and you want to push them toward being more engaged, but really they're all kind of in that normative brand. I think when you're running an account like the Obama account, it kind of flips on his head where basically everyone who engages either loves you or hates you. And the people in the middle are like, not engaging at all and completely tuned out. So I think we benefited from the fact that basically everyone responding to us or like the entire political environment meant that we weren't doing things like community management, you know, like we weren't responding to people as the Obama account. Can you imagine like it'd be a Fox News story the next day? (laughs) And so it made like the operations of the accounts and simpler in certain ways, but obviously a lot riskier and a lot more involved in other ways. Like we had to make sure we were spelling things correctly or like things were capital t true and like had research backing and the way that we phrased things were exactly the right kind of policy nuance about how those things should be phrased in a tiny you know 280 character tweet we had to respond to news cycles a lot faster with a lot more intentionality than most you know big accounts that can just kind of go quiet until things settle down a little bit or they figure out you know what's going on So it added a layer of complexity in terms of how far out we could plan. Like we didn't really do three month long content calendar. Like that was not a thing. Like the the, probably the longest timelines that we were looking on were a couple of weeks, you know, looking out at a policy decision or something that was going to be rolled out in a few weeks, like the rollout of the ACA marketplaces, for example, and making content that could be options that we could lean in on that, but still having a flexible enough workflow and governance where we could shut things down or adjust in real time if we needed to. Yeah. And I think now even brands can't plan out. I mean, maybe like, a vague understanding that okay in November we'll start talking about yeah holiday dinners or whatever but like the world is moving so quickly right now and everyone is just hyper connected all the time like you just it's kind of disastrous to plan that far in advance yeah that's one of the things that makes being a social manager now so hard is that you can't like just load things into a schedule or and expect it all to be tweeted without you're like really paying attention to what's popping in the news cycle that day or how things are going to be interpreted. And yeah, it's I don't envy people who run accounts like, you know, right now. I think they're we just had a thing. I mean, it was so, so silly, just my own Twitter, but uh, I had a pre scheduled tweet just talking about some of the successes of Snapchat. And it was scheduled to go live today. And I had totally forgotten because it wasn't anything controversial or remarkable. Of course, they laid off like 25% of their their (laughs) staff, which is not funny. It's terrible. And I was like, thankfully saw it like a few minutes after it went live. And I was like, that's super tone deaf to be like, yay, Snapchat, you know, the day after they lay off so many people. Yeah. So even on like a small scale, you have to be constantly on top of everything. Yep, absolutely. It's exhausting. I mean, On top of the fact that we still have this divide in terms of digital competency within a lot of organizations where they expect you kind of to be able to solve every PR crisis that comes up online with, you know, your social team, but they don't necessarily provide resources ahead of time to plan for that kind of thing. Like they're still pretty, you know, resource strapped, both from a team energy standpoint and anything else. So it hasn't been an easy job before, but I feel like it's increasingly getting easier. Yeah, I don't know that it's going to get easier anytime soon. Yeah. Well, right. this has been amazing, and everyone should go get your book and read it and review it and tell folks about it. But before we close out, we have this fun question that we ask everyone at the end. Hopefully, you are prepped or you can think on your feet. <laughs> Just because we, we talk all about influence and sway, we are curious, what commercial from your childhood still sticks in your brain today? Yeah, I love this question because I was trying to think like, what are the ones that have really stuck with me? And naturally, it's the ones that had the best jingles, right? 
the what's the the creepy doll this is funny because i remember the the song but i don't remember the uh, actual name buddy oh my oh, buddy yes it was my in the buddy song. yes <laughs> my buddy yes that was one or kid sister was was the equivalent of that i also remember the the tricks like silly rabbit tricks are for kids it was like that golden era of jingles and like catchphrases yep. that would just like brand powerhouses of course all the ones i'm thinking of are like aimed at children because that's you know when you were the most impressionable I'm well sure. as I shared in our first episode I was talking to Mary who you know and hers was mm. a game that was aimed at children and I keep sharing my embarrassing fact that mine was a cleaning product and I just really like the jingle of it <laughs> what was it Murphy's oil it was a good song <laughs> that's good yeah so clearly I was I did watch Saturday morning cartoons and I I do know all those jingles as well, but for whatever reason, the Murphy's Oil stuck with me. That's funny. That's the one, I think, silver lining of my kids being so, like having so much in-demand content. They'll never know the exquisite pain and pleasure of having to wait for your television show to come on like we did, but... They also are not as influenced by ads because they don't really watch as many ads as we did. So it's, you know, they, the, the worst thing, the things that I probably worry about the most are like YouTube interstitials, like things that are on their YouTube content. But other than that, they don't really get a lot of ads direct. We had a brief moment where YouTube conspiracy theories, like not full, like QAnon crazy, but like there was a brief moment where kids were kind of like, could this thing be true? This sounds crazy. And something about it was very appealing to them that the world could have this like secret, these secret things going on behind the scenes. And so, yeah, a lot of kind of, um, oh gosh, we got to talk about this right now. <laughs> they, they both have moved past that. I'm pleased to report we, we uh, educated yeah. them. Okay. <laughs> We're living examples of of having to teach our kids some digital media yeah. literacy in ways that more people need. For sure. For sure. So, well, thank you again so much. And why don't you tell everyone where they can find you? So obviously, Caleb Gardner on LinkedIn. And yep. I mean, I'm Caleb Gardner pretty much anywhere. CalebGardner.com, okay. Caleb Gardner on Twitter. So it's pretty, pretty easy to find. And then me. No Point B is your book and everyone's going to go out and get it and read it and yeah please and leave a review and reach out to me and tell me what you thought awesome i hope they will and thank you so much thank you for having me danielle it's been great thank you for listening don't forget to like share and subscribe please check back next monday for a new episode featuring marketing conversations through the lens of influence i am your host danielle wiley and this is the art of sway You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Amy Rosenberg hosts a great podcast called PR Talk. Amy, tell us what these fine folks will get when they listen. So we interview thought leaders and sometimes the media to not only learn about our jobs better, but to expand into new areas that tie in well with PR. But we also explore kind of what we think is more interesting. So things like work-life flow, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and just broader topics like that. Very interesting. Where can people subscribe? We're at prtalk.co, marketingpodcast.net, or you can search for PR Talk wherever you get your podcasts. You heard her. Go subscribe. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.